Hamels from Eindhoven University of Technology and Professor Jorge Cortez from the University of California, San Diego. The way today will work is we will have three 15 minute talks from each of the speakers. And after each talk, there will be five minutes for questions. After these talks, we will have a 30 minute panel discussion moderated by Toby Bedelbrook and myself uh, with a predetermined series of questions. Each speaker will be able to answer the questions. So with that said, we should be done in about an hour and a half. And as you have questions during the talks, please put them in the chat and then we will ask them at the end. With that said, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers briefly so that we can just transition quickly through the talks without breaking. Uh, professor Rudolf Sepulker is professor at the University of Cambridge in KU Levin, where he studies control, specifically spiking control systems, as well as optimization. He has earned numerous awards and accolades, which I cannot list all here, including uh, he is a fellow of the International Federation of Automatic Control, or IFAC, and is currently the editor-in-chief of IEEE Control Systems. Professor Hamels is full professor at Eindhoven University of Technology. He is an expert on event-triggered control and hybrid systems and has written numerous highly stated papers on the subject. Professor Hamels recently became a fellow of IFAC and in, in addition to his many other awards. Uh, additionally, he has just started as editor-in-chief of nonlinear analysis hybrid systems. All right, one more. So Professor Cortez is professor at the University of California, San Diego, where he studies network control and optimization with the aim of understanding why network systems work and how to systematically design better ones. Once again, he, Professor Cortez is a fellow of IFAC, has more awards than I can list just now, and is currently on the editorial board of the Journal of Nonlinear Science. So with that, uh, I'll hand off to Rodolf. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see. So this must be uh, some sort of historical event because I don't think a, a forum of neuromorphic control has ever been held before. And I'm very grateful to the organizers for organizing this. I, I wish we could have something similar in a control conference uh, at some point. Um, so I have prepared a few slides. Of course, it's not gonna be a technical talk, but I'm, I'm going to try to highlight um, the main reasons why I think it's a very exciting time for uh, control. And um, I would also try to highlight the sort of the key um, aspects of the research that we are pursuing in that direction um, now since over the last 10 years or so. So I think neuromorphic control is uh, very much in its infancy and should not be restricted in any way, but um, let me still uh, share with you how I see uh, neuromorphic control and what is uh, inspiring uh, to me. So I think of neuromorphic control as a neuro-inspired framework for event-based control across scales. And I've sort of uh, listed a number of uh, obvious applications where the simplest example of an event. Um, and I put um, events side by side with scales, because in my view, um, events determine scales and scales um, determine events. So those two are sort of very tightly connected to each other. And, um, and I think that's the event-based nature of um, this um, control strategy is very much what enables um, the sort of multiplexing across scales. Um, and I would think that in general, we don't have a theory currently of event-based control across scales. So it's very much a, an open question of control, but a, a question motivated um, by a number of applications that clearly have those elements of mixing uh, very tiny scales to very um, big scales, both in space as in time. And we don't know of any uh, more inspiring organism that nervous systems to do that in a, in a very efficient way. Um, now, to me, the, what is very novel and, and, and very challenging um, in your morphic control is to acknowledge the what I would call the mixed nature of spiking, 
the fact that um, spikes are physical signals. Um, so in, in a sense, they are analog signals and what whatever happens under the thresholds uh, can be classified as a continuous time signal. Um, and this is where the regulation is taking place. And so there is a lot of uh, processing uh, occurring there. But at the same time, we can count the spikes and, and more generally we can count the events. And there are, uh, uh, of course, a, a, a very rich diversity of events. Uh, events uh, are built from events. For instance, a burst is an event built from spikes, and we could go on. So um, events can be counted. They can be classified. Uh, so they have something very digital. Um, but at the same time, they are general. Um, so the promise of, of uh, I mean, the reason why this mixed nature of spiking is so central is because uh, I think that eventually what we, the promise of neuromorphic engineering is really that it's a new technology that could combine the best of the of two distinct worlds. So uh, information processing and information engineering has become very um dichotomized between the digital world and the analog world. It's difficult to have these two worlds talking to each other. Um, each uh, world has its own limitations. Um, and and um, the hope is that by sort of uh, developing this mixed um, technology that we see in nature, we can overcome some of the limitations, both from the analog world and from the digital world. Um, so the question is, uh, as a, as a, from a control viewpoint, how to acknowledge this uh, mixed nature of spiking? And um, so far, I've spoken at a very general level, which I think uh, probably uh, will be a property of any type of neuromorphic control. But now, from the next slide on, I will focus on the specific methodology that um, we have been developing in in our research. This, um, the, 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 at the core of this methodology, there is this uh, mixed feedback principle. Um, so if you look at this, uh, at the, the black block diagram, you recognize the very classical block diagram of a control system where the engineer designs a controller to regulate a plant. And regulate the plant can have many different meanings, but typically the signals that enter in between the controller and the plant is sort of it's called the load disturbance and co the the in, in in classical control the task of the controller is to attenuate the disturbance uh, from the this load disturbance to the output um in this particular uh, block diagram the load disturbance is occurring and for the notion of uh, for the for the sign of the feedback loop to be well defined so to talk about a, a, to, to a distinction between the negative feedback loop and the positive feedback loop, um, we need a, a sort of a sign-preserving property for all the blocks. And um, this property is monotonicity. Um, it's uh, the notion of operator monotonicity that I will not uh, talk about today. But um, you have to understand that we are talking about signals here. So each block is a dynamical system that receives as an input uh, either voltage or currents and that produce as an output uh, either output uh, voltage or current but um, it's a mapping from signals to signals so it is an operator and this mapping is dynamical so it has memory it is uh, typically non-linear um, and so in classical control in linear theory we represent those operators let's say with transfer functions but here we have a, we need a sort of a more abstract uh, input output representation. But this property of monotonicity um, is sort of uh, guaranteeing that the, the dynamics of the plant uh, or of the controller does not uh, reverse, the, cannot reverse the sign of the feedback loop. Now, um, if you think uh, for a moment about the, the, the most simple feedback loop with uh, just one input uh, and one output, um we we have a sort of a nice contrast that on the left uh, you have the, the conventional control uh, feedback loop which is a negative feedback loop and where the task of the controller is to attenuate the disturbance so if you compare the effect of a bump on the road this is now uh, 
the classical cruise control problem that you find in every textbook. Uh, if you compare the, 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 the difference between the open loop response to so the perturbation in velocity uh, resulting from a bump on the road, you see that the, in closed loop, the, the perturbation, the velocity is much smaller. So the, the controller, the closed loop controller uh, reduces the sensitivity of the plants to external disturbance. And on the right, you have, uh, in contrast, a mixed feedback loop where um, this could very be the model of a, of a neuron where the plant would be the passive membrane. So it would be modeled as an RC circuit, very much like the model of the car is modeled as a mass, mass damper. But um, the big difference is that now this controller is made of ion channels that, are, that can produce either positive or negative feedback. And as a consequence, the, the behavior is similar for small uh, disturbance. However, above a certain threshold, the response is very sharp and is an event. And this event signals that um, there is a disturbance coming into the system that is above threshold. And so you want to signal the disturbance um, in, uh, in contrast to attenuating the disturbance. And so this sort of very simple difference between classical control and uh, mixed control is very much, uh, in my opinion, what is at the core of um, um, neuromorphic uh, engineering and spiking control systems. We want to design systems that have thresholds. Why? Because uh, thresholds are the essence of excitability. They are the essence of what I earlier called scales. So each threshold will be responsible for an event and bigger events will be the result of combining different thresholds. So in addition of, um, of the usual, the classical objective of control, which is to regulate the, 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 the sensitivity of the input to output, the additional uh, aspect of neuromorphic control is that we want also to regulate thresholds and to control true thresholds. And that's really the, the sort of the fundamentally novel aspects to me of um, this event-based control that enables multi-scale um, and multiplexing uh, of uh, signals at very um, diverse um, and, and uh, both spatial and temporal scale. Now, the reason why I've chosen this very classical uh, architecture to represent these mixed feedback systems is because we don't want to start from scratch. If you open a textbook of neurodynamics, it looks like um, excitable systems have nothing to do with uh, classical uh, dynamical systems, that they are very complicated, that they must be studied through bifurcation analysis and through methods that are very poorly scalable. Um, and instead, uh, we want to sort of push the, the, the representation of a control system because uh, for, for two reasons. One reason is that we really want to develop a robust control framework. And uh, the second reason is that we want to um, leverage the, the existing control theory. And so we want to um, have a clear uh, connection to classical control theory. And so the, the, the connection is that if I remove the red part of the loop, I fall back into a theory that is very, very mature by now that a theory that is physical, that is um, developing control systems as port interconnections of, of circuits, a theory that is scalable because um, large scale complex optimization nowadays is all um, phrased in the language of monotone operators, a theory that is robust because it is from this feedback loop that control engineers define stability margins and we can define stability margins uh, in a analogous way for spiking systems. And uh, last but not least, uh, a structure that is uh, highly adaptive. Um, so this uh, feedback loop of monotone uh, systems is very, very, um, um, is the exact structure that you need to make adaptive control easy provided that um, the monotone operator, the controller is linearly parameterized, which is exactly uh, how we want to um, do adaptive control of those structure. I think I should um, come to an end. Um, I just want to flash one example of where this new architecture, this new type of control has led to uh, something very novel, I think, 
uh, for something that is uh, that has been studied for a long time, which is network control. And um, in network control, there is always uh, in classical control a sort of a, 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 um, a trade-off between the homogeneity of the population and uh, the controllability of the population. And here um, we have a, a sort of an architecture that allows to retain a lot of diversity and heterogeneity at the cellular level, and yet to uh, exactly exploit that heterogeneity and that um, diversity to tune the mean field that is represented on, on the right. And I think that's a sort of a very uh, novel way of uh, controlling networks through um, thresholds and modulation of thresholds. So just to summarize, I think that um, we are entering a new chapter, an entirely new chapter of control theory, um, where we design uh, multiscale rhythmic machines that can interact with multiscale rhythmic machines, and um, where we move away from um, classical control that is uh, putting a lot of emphasis on equilibrium designs and homogeneous designs, and that is um, often a bit monolithic um, to achieve uh, robustness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roloff. Maybe I will stop sharing. Yes. That's good. So if anyone has questions, you're free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and I will allow you to unmute. We have time for one question. Don't be shy. So, otherwise, I'll ask a question. Please. So, Rudolph, you know that uh, in certain brain diseases like epilepsy, the feedback breaks, right? And the brain goes unstable and starts oscillating or in such a way that it is not intended. So that suggests since epilepsy is quite prevalent and it's sensitive to small genetic variations, that this, this whole system is at the verge of instability always at least in certain areas of the brain where these epileptic seizures occur more often, think in the hippocampus particularly, but it can occur anywhere where the nervous system gets damaged by stroke or by injury. Things can go haywire and, and it really stops working. So what does that tell you about this distributed control system with lots of delay? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, epilepsy doesn't happen in every uh, animal. So uh, it, it's still a sort of... Um, a small fraction of the population that uh, where things go wrong um and but indeed um you know the robustness of these systems is not infinite there is no uh, miracle in 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 fact um if you think about um how efficient is this system and how dynamic is this system is quite remarkable that it behaves so uh, stably i would say so I wouldn't think that um, because it's because you have uh, these oscillations, we should say that it's at the verge of instability. I think it's pretty stable and, and more stable than many um, man-made devices. But of course, um, the, this, this stability is, I mean, the range of robustness is, is fine. And this has been studied um, um, even at the, in very tiny network, like this STG network that it is known that if you push neuromodulation uh, beyond reasons, you can indeed uh, get, uh, pro, uh, I mean, make the network dysfunctional. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, I see another question. I don't know whether I should. Oh, do you believe spikes or events have computational abilities over rate encoding beyond energy saving? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in what way? So in the sense that the timing of information can be extremely informative. And more generally speaking, I would say that um, it's the spatio-temporal nature of, um, of, of uh, perception that makes perception so easy, that makes discrimination so easy. So it really facilitates enormously um, discrimination when you have a spatial temporal a fine a spatial temporal resolution of uh, of of what you perceive or what you sense yeah. yeah in fact we had a lot of discussion there in Kapokachi about the fact that in dendritic tree you have active synapses and individual branches of a dendritic tree can act as rather fine precise at the five millisecond scale coincidence detectors 
that non-linearly detect coincidence between incoming spikes on that part of the dendritic tree, amplify it, and then pass that along with others to the soma that might initiate spikes. Now, this is but not to say that uh, that we should think that every single spike matters. Uh, a, a, a lot of spikes are rate codes, and so rate code, it's a very robust um, uh, phenomenon. But but I do think that uh, single spikes um, in in specific uh, circumstances can can contain a lot of information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need to go on? Abby? All right. Yeah. Let's um. Let's transition to Professor Hamels. Let's try to share my screen then. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Is it visible? Yes. Too? Yes. We okay. Can see. Perfect. Then, uh, then let's get uh, get going. Um, so thanks also to the organizers, of course, for inviting me. Um, so I, I try to talk a little bit today about event triggered control and and communication. And I must admit, I'm a rather new coming to the newcomer to this field of neuromorphic control. But I felt somehow challenged by the invitation and 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 trying to see how I could contribute by giving, let's say, a little bit of a glimpse of the field of event triggered control and communication. How it con could contribute to neuromorphic control on the one hand, but maybe also how neuromorphic control and computing could help the event triggered field. Right. So, um, so let's. Take a look a little bit what what the event, let's say the field of event triggered control and communication is all about. Uh, and I try to illustrate this with a let's say a very simple uh, control loop. Although of course in the field we've also been dealing with, let's say very complicated network system, distributed system, multi agent system. But for the, for the sake of this talk, I think it's it's maybe good to to keep things uh, quite quite basic. Um. Right, so suppose we have a standard feedback loop, so a physical system that has to be controlled, and we have a sensor, an actuator, and a controller. And maybe one of these communication channels or a certain computational resource is rather uh, resource constraint, right? There has certain limitations. And typically, if we do, if you look at the standard paradigm of control, which is really uh, the time triggered periodic uh, control paradigm. We see that all the control tasks are essentially executed periodically and triggered just by looking looking at time. So if you have a sensor that gives us information about the physical system, what does that mean? That in principle, there is a sort of fixed sampling period at which we read out the sensor, get information about an output or the state of the system. And this is then transmitted to the controller, which also, let's say, periodically executes all its, its control tasks and updates basically the control signal that is implemented at the actuator. And this is done, let's say, repetitively. So it doesn't take too much time to, to actually realize that this is a very inefficient way of using, let's say, the communication resource or, or a computation resource. In a sense, that's only, let's say, the way of, of deciding when to use the resource or when to communicate is, is just purely, let's say, determined by time, right? It's just by, by time elapsing. elapsing. And of course, we don't consider at all whether or not it's important to transmit this information, let's say, from the sensor to the controller, right? It might even be the same information as we already sent on the previous timestamp, but there is no way of, of looking into that. So in the field of, of event-triggered control and event-triggered communication, we try to be more resource aware, right? And only try, for instance, to use this, uh, the, the, this resource-constrained communication link only when it's really needed. Right, so basically, we try to build intelligent sensors that 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 are not just uh, let's say transmitting information because time has elapsed, but maybe look at the information and based on the information decide whether or not this should be transmitted over the network. Right, and in doing so, the the main idea is that instead of using a lot of communication events, we try to do this more sporadically. Right, so to limit the exchange of information between the sensor and controller, and and by that actually limit the overall utilization of the of the resources. So to give this a little bit or to make this a little bit more concrete, so if we denote the transmission times, let's say by T of K, right? So these are the moments that actually this 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 connection between the plant and the controller is closed. So the way we we try to do that is be designing certain triggering functions that determine when we actually uh, do uh, perform a transmission. And a very simple one could be descent on delta paradigm, which just says, hey, I look at my current measurement, I compare it to the last value that was actually uh, transmitted. So I don't know that throughout this talk by, by y hat. And if this difference is in, in norm or, or an absolute value bigger than a certain threshold, that's when we transmit information. That's when I use 
this valuable communication resource, right? So here we, we close then this, this loop over here. But as long as my current value is very close to the, to the previous one that I transmitted, so smaller than this delta threshold, I'm not transmitting any, any information, right? And with that, the plan is to save, to save resources. So to give you a little bit of an idea, I, I prepared a, a small video. This is an experiment that we did in the lab, right? It, it, it's basically the idea to stabilize uh, an unstable uh, inverted pendulum. And I'm, I'm going to show you three implementations just to, to give you a little bit of an idea. So I have a time triggered controller that just works at a fixed sampling time. So at these moments, let's say sensor output is transmitted to the controller. I do this at, at, so at one millisecond, I do it at eight millisecond, and I do it in an event triggered way. Right, so where basically we use the cent on delta, and only when the the current measured angle of the of the pendulum, ex, let's say compared to the previous one that was transmitted, exceeds a, a, let's say three milli radians. And here on the graphs you see the the angle, right? So we try to keep this uh, close to zero because that's the upright uh, position that we try to stabilize. And here you see the time between two transmissions. So basically, it's related to how much uh, we use the the resource. So here we see the time triggered controller. It's it's doing well, right? So of course it's time triggered. So this is communicating all the time at one millisecond. And here we have a quite violent disturbance acting on the system, right? You also see that here in the angle. So if you do this with eight milliseconds, right? So then of course we save resources, but now this violent perturbation disturbance that we had on the system cannot be. Uh, taken care of by this sort of slow communication. If you do event triggered control, we see we only sporadically do this communication, only when it's really needed. When the basically when the disturbance kicks in, we have for a short moment of time a few very fast transmissions, right? But only during the the disturbance, and after that we go actually to very high uh, inter event times again, right? And in doing so, basically what we what we more or less achieve is we have. This event triggered implementation gives you some somehow the same performance as a very fast time triggered controller, but only requires 1% of the resources. Right, so this is the basic, um, let's say objective that we try to accomplish with event triggered controller communication, same performance, but using way less uh, of, the, of the resources for, for implementation purposes. So of course, if you're going to design, let's say, event triggered controllers, right? That means we have to design this this uh, triggering function that determines when we use the resource or when we when we communicate, and we have to design this 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 controller. And of course, the two together have to realize two things. So first of all, they have to realize the quality of control, right? So are the good old properties of stability, performance, robustness, consensus, whatever properties we want to have. But on the other hand, we also want to make sure we have a, let's say, reduction in the resource utilization, right? And this, this requires basically to show that the transmission times that are being generated by this triggering function are well behaved. And one of the properties we at least want to somehow guarantee is that we, we do not have the Zeno behavior, which would be an infinite number of transmissions in finite time. So somehow we would like to prove that these, these transmission times generated by the triggering function, they have a certain lower bound that is a lower bound on the time between two successive transmissions, right? Because if you won't have this, then actually we're doing worse than actually the, time, the classical time triggered periodic paradigm. So on top of that, we also would like to guarantee, of course, somehow, if possible, in a formal way that we have a reduced communication with respect to the best time triggered controllers. Right, while, while guaranteeing the same type of stability and performance properties. And that is something that is also crucial. And, and if time allows, I will get back to that shortly to the end of this, uh, this short talk. So just to give you a little bit of an idea how we do typically the, the modeling and analysis uh, of event triggered controllers, I want to share with you a, some hybrid system models that, that play a major role there and which possibly also could play a role in, in the analysis of, of neuromorphic control on, on, on larger, larger scales. So to give you an idea here, let, let's again take this picture of this, this connection over here. So we have the plant and the controller. Right, and the plant typically, so this is a physical plant, uh, the typical mathematical models we use for that are just given by standard differential equations, where XP is the plant state, right, so that could be the, the angle of the inverted pendulum, uh, its angle of velocity, etc. 
U denotes the control input, so the control signal that we put on the on the plant, and W is a disturbance input. And the Y variable here denotes typically uh, some information that we have regarding the plant state, right? So this is something that we get from a from a sensor measurement. So in this case, we assume the controller is also given by uh, a certain differential equation, where X C are the controller states. Uh, I use the generated control output. So in fact, the input that goes into the plant and this controller can only use Y hat, right? So that's the last received information that it got from the sensors because simply because of the packet-based communication, because we only sometimes at discrete moments of time, we close this loop. It only has access on the transmission times to the exact value of Y, but in between, it's actually not sure what this Y value uh, precisely is. So due to this, uh, this this sampling, so this this discrete transmission that we have in this uh, this this event triggered control loop, we we get an error that is induced by the sampling, which we denote by 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 this error e. And if you look at the behavior of of how this error behaves over time, so what we typically see is that so between transmissions, it's it's typically increasing or behaving in in a continuous fashion. But at the moment we close the loop, right? So at, the, at a transmission time, that actually this this error is reset to zero, right? Because the y hat is actually equal to y. So we reset e to zero. Then it actually flows again, according in in a continuous way. And if you transmit again, we we get uh, again the reset of the error to zero. So some somehow this naturally uh, pushes us in the direction of of let's say appropriate models to describe such a closed loop event triggered control system by using hybrid models, so hybrid system models that actually have flow dynamics, right? So they're actually flowing in between the transmissions. So this holds both for the E dynamics and the X dynamics, so the plant and the controller states. And at the moment we transmit, we essentially reset the error to zero and the plant and the controller states in principle in event triggered controllers typically stay the same, right? So the physics, so XP and XC remain remain the same even over uh, a transmission. So the key question then is how to generate now these transmission times so, or this triggering function that generates these transmission time in order to give this hybrid system, so this closed loop system, actually proper behavior, right? So in terms of stability and performance, but also in terms of these transmission times and, and, and hopefully we are capable of, re, re, let's say, reducing the utilization of the, of the communication resources. So in doing so, we have to, that actually means we have to analyze these type of, of, of closed loop, loop models for, for our, our, our system, right? So where we flow when the, when the error is small or, or let's say satisfy certain, certain conditions. And when this error becomes too big, we reset actually this, this error to zero. So if you think already a little bit on, on, on how these kind of paradigms could be used in, in a neuromor neuromorphic uh, context. Um, so one of the th ideas that is, is typically quite different in the event triggered control field is that we use some sort of continuous models here, right? And if I think if you want to move these kind of ideas more into the neuromorphic field, and actually I think we also should allow controllers that have spiky behavior which will actually still be, be close to the model I showed you originally, but it would make the change here that this, this actually this, these, these controller states or these, and these plant states do not say the same over, let's say, a transition or over a, tr a transmission, but actually they may change too, right? Because of pulsive behavior, right? Or that may be some of the ideas that are present in the event-triggered control field could also be used in the context of neuromorphic controllers and analyzing properties of these these systems right so just to give you a little bit of an idea about the type of results that that are available in the event triggered control area and also the things that 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 are currently not solved let, let's take a look at a very basic example actually take it from this 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 let's say celebrated paper by paulo taboada so actually one of the first on event triggered control with all the guarantees that we were looking for is if we have a plant that has this very simple model, right? So this can describe some physical system. We have a state feedback controller, and we're going to compare time triggered control, right? So a standard time triggered control where we sample every 0 0.025 time units. We're going to compare this to a relative event triggered controller where we trigger events. So we communicate between the plant and the controller when this 
uh, event condition is true, right? So it's not a send on delta because in this case, we even have a relative type of threshold here where you see here the norm of the state. So if you look at, at how the system behaves for the time-triggered controller, let's say over time, where, where the, the objective is to regulate the states to the origin, we see here the norm of the state over time, and you see it's nicely controlled to the origin. And of course, in a time-triggered controller, the time between two transmissions is actually constant, right? Actually constant to the, to the value that we took, took over here. So if you take an event triggered controller, you see here the red dash line, basically we see the virtually the same performance, right? But the benefits again come from the side of, of resource utilization, right? You see here the fluctuations in the, in the inter event time. So they become significantly larger than the value that we saw before for the time triggered controller without changing the performance. Right, so in this case, we save a lot of the transmissions while having the same properties as the as the time the the time triggered implementation. Unfortunately, this does not all work always. Right, so this was kind of an ideal scenario where we have full state access. There were no disturbances, and even if we change this a little bit, right, so if we just introduce some some let's say tiny disturbance into this control loop, then you already see a major difference. So we do not see the the difference over here. Right, because if I just quickly go back, you see that in principle, the 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 the, the, con the regulation of the state to the origin pretty much stays the same because this is really a tiny disturbance, but there is a big change in the effect on when we have to transmit. Right, so this is a very sensitive design, and that means there is is basically work to do, and not all of these kind of of solutions that you can think of are always working, and and you see the sensitivity here to 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 measurement noise. And similar kind of aspects if happen in case you do not have access to the full state, but you only have, let's say, access to certain particular outputs. Then similar behavior, the Zeno behavior actually pops up. So for that, over time, of course, uh, there were all sorts of more advanced scheme than, let's say, the simple one that you that you saw before that just has this sort of relative type of, of, of triggering, right? So when the error exceeds a certain relative threshold, so simple solutions could be yeah, to enforce, let's say, just the waiting time right, to avoid this problem that we just saw, which, which I believe is not, not the best solution. Other solutions that have been approach, uh, proposed is basically using a more a dynamic event trigger controller. So instead of triggering, let's say, purely on a condition of this type, use a filtered version of this, right? introduce, a, let's say, a dynamic variable that filters this version and then trigger on the eta, on this dynamic variable. And this is a, a way more effective way of doing things, right? And maybe this is already could be, I mean, it would be interesting to see how this relates to certain neuromorphic type of, of implementations. Another version, which uh, is also quite popular, at least in the control field, with which I feel that maybe in the context of neuromorphic control, this is maybe uh, less preferred because you still need an active clock in your, in your system, is where you try to combine, let's say, time trigger periodic control and, and periodic and an event triggered control on the on the other hand, in the sense that we still have an event triggering condition of this type or any other that you prefer, but instead of checking this one continuously, so basically when this threshold is is uh, is, is 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 passed, we only do this in a time triggered fashion, right? So. In the control field, this is a, a, a pretty strong implementation, but from a neuromorphic point of view, the need for a clock is, is possibly not, not desirable. So just to show you how this could overcome this, this kind of, of sensitivity to noise that we had to the earlier static type of, of solutions, if you take such a dynamic trigger, right, so the one that doesn't need a clock, then essentially you see here, um, that on the performance side, not much has changed, right? It's pretty much the same as we saw before. But on the inter event time side, so on the on the resource utilization side, we see we do way better than here. So the, the sensitivity actually to these disturbances is 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 pretty much lost. So to wrap up shortly, so I have I have two slides left. Um, so I want to also give you one. Um, glimpse of work that has been done in the in the event triggered control community where we really try to prove let's say in theory let's say by analytical results that event triggered control can outperform time triggered periodic control 
I don't, will not go into full details, but if you use certain classical costs that are often used, so average quadratic cost, that's over here, and the average transmission rate, then here we see, and we can guarantee this by design, that we have periodic, or so, sorry, event-triggered control implementation that are strictly better than time-triggered implementations, right? So at the same cost, we can, can achieve that at, let's say, a factor two or even more reduction in communication rate. So to conclude, um, so I tried to give you a glimpse or so a little bit of the tip of the iceberg of, 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 of just to give you an idea about what's going on in the event-triggered control field. And the main idea there is that, that we try to obtain, let's say, the same quality of control, where, but, but achieve this with a significant reduction in the utilization of the resources, particularly communication resources. So I believe it, it's quite promising in theory, right? So we have these examples that really show that you can analytically outperform the, the, the standard time-triggered controllers, but also in various applications, right? So one of, of them that, that we've been using uh, this, this event-triggered communication on is in these kind of, of vehicle platooning. So I believe, or I hope I showed you a little bit how hybrid systems play a crucial role in the formal analysis of these systems. And that maybe even extensions are possible if you have a spiking type of, of controllers. And for me, it would be very interesting to see how we could connect this, uh, this line of reasoning, let's say more to the, to the neuromorphic control field. So with that, uh, I, I thank you for, uh, for listening and I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you very much. So I think we have one question in the chat. I will read it. Um, so the question is, it looks like event-triggered control is very well suited for stabilization, but what if an agent has to integrate information continuously and make discrete decisions between, say, different dynamical behaviors as a function of their measurements, attractors, motor primitives, or the likes? So then the question proceeds, how flexible is the architecture? Can it incorporate switching states between different controllers? And then follows up with maybe there's a point of contact here between neuromorphic control and event trigger control. Do you have any comments on that? I'm just shortly trying to digest the question. Um, so of course, so I, I, I basically so so I don't have a, a, a directly a complete answer ready, but but but, but we have been applying. So I, I showed single loop perspective here. So of course, event triggered controls have been. Uh, using combination with different types of controllers, right? So not only smooth controllers, but also switching controllers, and also, of course, for multi-agent type of systems, maybe like in the platoon where you have a lot of physical systems, a lot of controllers that together have to have to interact. So the possibilities are are broader than what I I sketched here, uh, and possibly could deal with with switch controllers as well. Great, thank you. All right. I have I a question for Maurice. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah. So every time a neuron in the brain spikes, it's decided to send an event to other neurons, which is costs a tremendous amount of energy, right? It's half the energy, half the energy of the brain is generating these spikes. And so it must be doing this kind of activity driven control in some way. So what do you think we can learn from studying brains or parts of brains about the strategies? For this, and as a, and related to that, how much have you done in relation to using machine learning to learn what are these triggering uh, criteria for sending these events? Right now, it sounds like you're handcrafting these criteria. Yes. So I must say, so my line of, of research, so my personal line of research has been mostly, let's say, designing these triggering conditions indeed from using insights in, in the dynamics of the system. And so, so from a mathematical perspective. There have been activities also in the field. So I, I know a few people that have been working on, on trying to learn these triggering functions, right? So what, one thing, of course, could be looking at the brain. So how do they do it and take inspiration from that? The other one is learning it. So using reinforcement learning kind of approaches to still try to stabilize or whatever control property you want to have. And at the same time, try to reduce the communication as much as you can. So there have been people in the field looking at, at these kind of approaches too, although I personally didn't, didn't work on that. Okay, thank you. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll... okay, so um, yeah, uh, th thanks a lot. I, I, I think 
it's great to organize uh, something like this, and I actually be very excited uh, about it. Um, I, I thank Levi and Toby for the invitation to, to speak here. And I, I, I realize I prepared maybe a few too many slides. So at some point, you know, when I'm over the, the time limit, just let me know and I'll just jump to the conclusions, whatever, whatever, whatever I am. So um, um, before I start, I guess I should say that what, what the, the type of work that I'm gonna present is joint work with my former student, Erfan Nosari, which is now a professor at uh, UC uh, Riverside. And I, I thought that before I began, I will give like a, one quick slide, uh, a little bit more general, not specific to, to brain uh, networks uh, about uh, the, the research that uh, we do in, in my group. And uh, basically it's about distributed control of network systems. And uh, we have uh, broadly speaking, these two basic goals. On the one hand, understand the mechanisms that make complex uh, networks function the way they do. I guess we are excited about uh, these examples where distributed interactions between agents of nodes lead to emergent global behavior, and then uh, take advantage of that understanding to design engineering networks with predictable, predictable behavior. So uh, we get inspired by biological systems for sure, motion coordination, uh, decision making, uh, and things like this, and definitely by uh, things like, like the brain, which are massive network systems. You know? um, and then uh, also by the number of engineering network uh, systems that uh, are around us, starting with social networks or, or uh, the examples that some of the examples that Maurice was also mentioning in his talk, the intelligent transportation or uh, smart grid or things like this. And so um, I guess it's impossible to give a, a summary of, of everything we, we try to uh, deal with, but uh, I thought I, I would list these kind of sample questions that uh, encapsulate many of the things that we look at. So we definitely look at architectures. Uh, what is the organization of the network that is leading to the particular uh, design or a particular objective no, that the network is trying to, to accomplish. Uh, we look a lot at uh, the interplay between the structure of the network and the dynamics and the, and the function, what the network is actually trying to do. Um, we look also at uh, information, who has the information, uh, how is that information being processed and transmitted throughout, throughout the network, what is the value of information, like, like the type of things that Maurice was also mentioning in his, in his talk. And um, because we come from systems and control, definitely we are in the, uh, interested in dynamic understanding of how things are changing and why, and what type of guarantees can we give about convergence, performance, robustness, and, and things like this. Okay, so uh, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, a, a problem in, in neuroscience, I guess, goal-driven selective attention that we, it has a long history and we've just taken a, a kind of a systems and controls perspective into it to see to what extent we could uh, inspire by all the experimental observations about goal-driven selective attention and how this is achieved in the brain to, to see if we could uh, somehow, uh, I don't know what the right word is, replicate, reproduce it, explain it in a, in a kind of a dynamics uh, uh, angle, right? Or from a dynamics perspective. And so uh, I, I guess I have a video here, but I won't play it because uh, there is not much time. And uh, I'm sure most of you already know this video where it's an old video where uh, the, we, the viewers, are asked to count the number of times that the white team passes the basketball between each other. And there is a white team and then there is a black team. And so you see the video, you count, I don't know if it's 15 or 17 times, something like this. But then you get us the second question, which you did not expect, which is, but did you see the gorilla, right? And so in, in the middle of all this uh, process, there is a gorilla passing by and, uh, you know, pounding his or her chest, well, his chest, I guess. And then um, uh, the, the, you get asked, and about 50% of the people do see the gorilla, about 50% uh, of uh, people do not see the, the gorilla. And so this is kind of a result of this idea of this goal-driven selective attention, right? So the brain uh, is uh, exposed to all these different stimuli, yet we are able to actively control, uh, I guess, what we are paying attention to. And there are multiple examples uh, across different scenarios. And so, as we know, the, the brain is a highly complex dynamical system that has those selective population activities. So at different times, different regions or different areas, different 
parts within each region of the brain are active, not the whole brain is active all the time. Um, uh, so the, the, here I have like a, a few basic observations about general brain organization that later we are gonna try to capture with our model. And so these are basically, okay, there are sensory information pathways uh, in, the, in the brain where the stimuli enter through uh, auditory cortex or visual cortex, right? So sensory areas and travels all the way to more decision-making uh, information processes kind of areas, prefrontal cortex, and, and maybe and back, right? So there is this, you know, up and down information transmission. There is this time scale separation between the different areas. Sensory areas are typically much faster in processing information than decision-making areas. And then there is this disjoint population representation where certainly certain groups of neurons or, or collections of neurons are actively encoding this stimuli, right? And you know, these correspond to the gorilla, these correspond to the, to the white team and things like this. And then there are all these process about you know, inhibiting the activity of certain uh, uh, groups of neurons or, or regions of the brain and actively recruiting others to perform a task. And so this kind of leads me back to what I was saying about the selective uh, or the sparse population activity within the brain. But uh, in many of the network uh, models that we uh, know, uh, uh, the, the, the way activity arises is not selective and is not sparse. Uh, and so for instance, maybe a good example to think about is uh, like a social network, right? If somebody starts spreading uh, some sort of misinformation, right? And then you, know, you sort of excite a node, right? And that's the node starting to with the rumor. And then this thing kind of, you know, uh, makes its way throughout the whole network, right? So this, this uh, impulse or this step uh, uh, input to the network kind of propagates throughout it, right? And that's not the typical thing that you see in the, in the brain, right? When you see that activity is happening here and then happening there and then happening uh, somewhere else. So that, that's what I was inspiring us to try to understand, okay, can we you know, have models and uh, from a controls perspective, uh, uh, try to describe or understand what, what's going on. Okay, so uh, we, we make, uh, from computational neuroscience, we look at these um, uh, mesoscale models, neural mass uh, representations, where we actually don't look at the spikes, <laughs> but we look at firing rates instead, right? So average uh, uh, rate of, of the spiking, we make some simplifying assumptions so that essentially we can end up with this um, uh, kind of sigmoidal no, representation, mean field approximations. And so here you see, uh, you, you know, each node represents a population of neurons. So it's not micro, it's not a particular neuron, and it's also not macro, it's kind of in between aggregations of neurons. So each uh, state represents the average firing rate of a particular population, roughly neurons that have the, si the similar firing rate. And then the network dynamics is governed by, by this equation over here. So you see that there is some time scale for how fast or slow things are happening. In the absence of anything uh, external, then there will be a, a, an exponential decay right, to zero of the firing rate. But you know, there is coupling, and so here there is an activation function, this sigmoidal. There is potentially an external stimuli, right? Maybe other regions of the brain, maybe external. And then there is the connectivity, right? So there is the synaptic weight matrix, and you know, whatever firing rates the other nodes are having has an effect on me. Uh, some might be excitatory, and so those are represented with the pluses here, right? And some might be inhibitory, and those are represented with the, with the minus over there. So um, people have played with uh, this uh, for a long time. And so um, you can get to the celebrated Kuramoto model depending on what type of approximations you do to that uh, dynamics. Uh, instead, we actually just do like a piecewise uh, linearization of it. Uh, and so we, we just go with this uh, description. And, and then uh, essentially this is the type of, of dynamics that, that we uh, study. And when you look at what that dynamics is, is uh, well, it's actually a hybrid system too. You can think of it like, like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that point in, in, a, in a little bit. But before I do that, I wanted to encode those general observations about the brain with these models now in mind, right? And so we were talking about information processing pathways, right? So what we are gonna do is we are gonna have a, literally a, a sequence of networks. So you, you wanna think about it, we have like a network of networks, right? And so each layer here corresponds to one uh, 
element of this pathway, right? And each one of these layers is uh, modeled by uh, one of these uh, dynamics that we were just describing, right? And so they are interconnected with each other, right? Because, you know, information goes up and down, right? And so that's why here in this input over here, you see, you know, elements that depend from the layer above and elements that depend from the layer below. I hope I'm, I'm getting the I minus one and I plus one, right? There is potentially uh, some external input also to that layer and some control at, at, at decision making at that layer. So there is also time scale separation. So these layers work at different time scales. And then there is this hierarchy, right? Where uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, top layers are working slower than the lower layer. And then there is this idea of the disjoint population representation where basically we say, well, at each layer, there is a group of nodes that are relevant to the task at hand, right? The counting basketballs, basically. And there is another group of neurons that are not relevant to the task at hand and whose activity essentially needs to be inhibited, right? And so uh, when you have this, basically now you have a complicated control system, <laughs> right? When you have uh, this hierarchical structure, and uh, dynamics at each level and this interconnection between them. And so, for instance, for inhibition, the hypothesis is basically, well, we want to drive the um, activity of the task irrelevant nodes to, to zero, right? To the origin, basically. And for the um, recruitment, that means that we want to drive the activity of the task relevant nodes to uh, either some equilibrium, which is non-zero, or some sort of tracking certain trajectory. And so, well, how, how can this be achieved? And, and here I'm just looking at the simplest case, I guess. So I'm looking at the smaller, the, the bottom layer, the layer at the, at the bottom. And so there's not going to be any layer below it, right? So that's why you don't see an N plus one. I'm also going to forget for a second about the layer above, right? I'm just going to look at this as a, some, some sort of dynamics, right? Where I, I get to choose the input and there might be also some external um, uh, background activity. Professor so, Cortez, yes. Well, you do need to wrap up soon in the interest of time. So okay, okay. So yeah. how, how much? Thank how you much very much. Do I have? Uh, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. Wow. Okay. So let's see if I can get it, uh, to it. Well, I guess I wanted to get to to this point, um, which I mentioned before, which is that you know this is a state dependent uh, suite system, right? And uh, you, you, uh, basically, it has to do with the saturation level here, right? If you get to the bottom, if you are in the linear regime, or if you are in the upper layer, right? And so um, this gives rise very easily to very complex dynamics, even though in each region of the state space, things are reasonably simple. They are essentially linear, right? But when you put these two these things together, then they become, uh, you know, can give rise to multi-stability, bifurcation, chaos, et cetera. And uh, maybe I'll finish here just to make the connection with control. Um, as, as we know, uh, you know, uh, hybrid systems or state dependent systems are really tricky. And so here I'm giving you an example of two uh, dynamical systems, right? Two modes, both of them are stable. If you look at this, no, I, I would just go to zero. And if you look at here, I would just look to zero. But the, the, depending on how I put them together, I will get a completely different behavior, right? So if I put here, for instance, uh, uh, the mode, mode one here, mode two here, mode two here, and mode one here, right? It means that when I'm here, I'm gonna evolve according to mode one, right? So I'm gonna do something like, like this, no? And then here I'm gonna go according to mode two, right? Oh, sorry, mode two, right? And then mode one and mode two and so on. So I will this will be a stable, right? But if instead if I switch this and I say, well, instead I'm just gonna do uh, here two, one, one, two, then you see that the behavior that you get is actually something that looks like that, right? So completely unstable. So it's the same components, but the switching matters uh, very much. And uh, in, in this case, the switching is even uh, input dependent. So it, it's even uh, more complicated. So I think I'm, I'm out of time and uh, I, I, I don't have enough time to tell you about some exciting uh, stuff, but uh, I, I guess I'll just jump to the, to the, to the conclusions and leave it here. Thank you, Leto. Yeah, this is it. I think I should stop here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm off my two minutes now. 
can you yeah it's lovely jorge i wish we had time to go through all of this stuff i think it's just lovely to think about yeah. all these things very interesting yeah um should see if there are any questions about it i have one question that comes up directly again from capocaccia um from henry kennedy who's measured connections between brain regions anatomically very mm -hmm. carefully in uh higher mammals and every every area of cortex is connected to every other area with feed forward and twice as many feedback connections and even areas that you would think would not be directly connected like from v1 all the way to the very frontal eye fields they are still connected by some tens of thousands of neurons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so whatever you do here when you draw something uh, linear like that it's just very inaccurate in relation to real brain regions and now you try to get make sense out of this with theory um you get some results but i bet they're quite hard to apply in practice to design controllers right I, I, yeah i i, I agree I, actually again because i didn't have time but we did we did uh, a case study uh where we, we didn't do anything but we took the data from that paper that you see there at the bottom uh with rodents uh and we sort of I guess at least we try to validate our conclusions. It's not clear that the data, I mean, what we do sort of validates it, right? But it's not clear that it is a, <laughs> and, and so the, this, this experiment is very interesting where they, they had these uh, rodents and they were uh, subject to two stimuli, right? Left and right warble and high and low pitch, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they are taught to kind of focus attention on one or the other and they get a reward if they do the right thing, essentially, right? And, and in that paper, basically what they were saying is that uh, the, those original findings that you see over there, right? They, they were essentially saying that it looked like the top layer, right, PFC, was driving the activity of the auditory cortex, even though the auditory cortex is the one that actually senses, right, the, the, the sounds or the... And, and so then, because this was, this type of experiment was matching very well this information pathway and the selective attention, we, we actually redid all the all the experience, I mean all, all the statistical analysis of the paper uh, and spent a, a few months <laughs> doing so and then eventually uh, sort of validated um, you know so yeah this is basically what we did a long story I, I guess uh, uh, but yeah we, we essentially were able to kind of at least, much to the theoretical findings that we had, right? That there was a time scale separation uh, in, in, the, in the areas that we were you know, looking at and that the conditions for stability that we had found were met when, when we actually tried to find the, the, the interconnections, right? Between these areas, which were not quite measured experimentally, right? But we tried to reconstruct out of the data that they had. So that's okay. what I say. It's not clear that we validated the theory, but because we don't know that the weights that we found are the right weights, probably they are not. But at least they were found matching the data that that the authors provided. So uh, this is what we. Did. Okay, good. Perhaps you could put a link to that paper in the chat. Oh, of course. Of the Zoom, yeah. and in the meantime, there's also a question right from from Matthew um, Avenusa. Oh yeah, there we go. The question specifically is: How would you potentially learn the top-down selection? When you're considering these kind of attentional mechanisms. Yeah, uh, I see. I see. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I do not know the answer to. Um, I, I guess what we did was trying to understand how would the uh, top-down selection, right, will will happen uh, dynamically, right? And so that, that's what our paper does. Uh, I, I will imagine that this will change, you no, know, from one task to another. And even the, the populations that are involved will also change. Uh, we have not done that. Uh, well, let me ask you a question directly. Uh -huh. For the neuroscientists, what kind of experiments should they do to understand control strategies related to stability? Uh -huh. what, oh, if, yeah. what perturbation experiments should they do I that see. they're not doing now? Wow, that's a deep that's a deep question. Uh, okay, it's too it's too vast, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's too vast. Okay. That that is like, uh, but you know, it's been days I mean, on. I'd love I'd love to have way more data than the one I have for even just this simple experiment. I mean, simple. <laughs> well, way more data of what type? 
right. more, okay. more so, neural so, activity? And, yeah, more neural activity, right? The, this I have just 100 neurons in only two regions, right? So, you know, okay. more regions, more neurons. Uh, ideally, you know, weights or a description of what the actual, you know, connect, synaptic weight strength, no? That, because we, we had to make it up, made it up, right? We, we made it up uh, at the end of the day, right? So uh, some, that, that would be awesome, that would be awesome. Well, you know, the, the connectome, the complete connectome of some animals is, is available now. Yeah. But it's been available for decades about from C. elegans, right? The complete connectome was available for decades. People still don't understand how the C. elegans worm works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it may be that in a small animal, there's a lot of chemical computation. Maybe in all brains, there's a lot of molecular computation that's hard. It's impossible currently to measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, you certainly won't run out of room mm -hmm. to work. Okay, I think we have to move on, Levy, right? Yes, we do. All right, so let's move on to the panel discussion and let's make sure everybody is visible and pinned appropriately. And I'm gonna put the panel questions up. Can everybody see those? Yep. Yes. So right. we were gonna make a call. So I think we should start um, with uh, maybe the last speaker first. Okay. I mean, yeah, so which which question would you like, or we'll open it, you know, first come, first served. So, so is it me, the, 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 the person that is choosing? Ah, yes, if you would like to choose one of the six questions, I'll switch to that I one. I mean, I, I can go with this one. It's okay. not this question specifically, but I mean, something that occurred to me um, uh, when I was giving to Rodolphe and then also to Maurice is that uh, I, I saw a connection. I mean, definitely, you know, uh, um, Rodolphe was talking about the, the discrete and the continuous, right? And that's almost by definition a hybrid system, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, uh, in, um, in the type of evolutions that one considers. But uh, usually in hybrid systems, you are looking at either uh, continuous time evolution or discrete transitions. Uh, and and that, that was similar to the, I guess, to the, you know, continuous evolution of a signal that produces a spike, right? And, and, and one point of connection that I saw was that uh, in event real control, um, uh, there is also information, not only, not only on, the, on the message, right? When, when Maurice was describing things, right? You, you sent the updated state, right? So there is no, not only information in the actual message, but there is also information in the timing, right? The fact that you are doing it at that time, right? So, so for instance, if the um, if the sensor knows the policy, basically that the sorry, the other way around, if the controller knows the policy that the sensor is following to to decide when to transmit, right? So if the controller knows the sensor is going to send me a message when the difference between you know the last message and the new one is bigger than delta or something like that, right? So if, if the controller knows this fact, then by, by the sheer just fact that there is a transmission, there is already information in there, right? Contained, no? You already know that there is at least a difference of delta, right? You don't know what it is, right? But at least you know, and that's also information. So I thought there was this um, nice connection between, you know, spiking information containing the timing and potential for use in event trigger control too. Okay, what about you, Maurice? What do you, how do you, can you react to that? Yes, so so for me, I mean, of course, we saw in in in, in your his talk already the the piece was linear structure, the switching structure. So in in, in this kind of 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 way, you could approximate the, the 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 behavior of the neurons by hybrid type of behavior. Um, so so that was clearly present. Um. So I also hinted a little bit upon this in in my talk, right? Where where you could you let's say the spiky behavior you could you could model this as as, as sort of resets of certain variables, right? So the, the the integral of the spike is doing something to your system uh, when a certain threshold is passed, right? So I I was thinking if these kind of models could be used, let's say, to describe these kind of spiky control systems. Um, although I feel that the difficulty is you have many of those, right? So I think that the hybrid systems tools that we have might not be very suitable for analyzing a lot of these neurons that all have their own local hybrid behavior. So, but in principle, it should, it should be doable, but I think the tools are not scalable for that at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Although I'm intrigued, I mean, maybe also challenging uh, Rodolfo a little bit here. Is, is So I would be interesting to see how his continuous discrete would be, what would be a good hybrid model for that, right? So where, I mean, there's quite some some literature on hybrid systems. So So how could we merge these two fields? Okay, uh, so it's a question that I'm often asking. Can, can I share uh, for, for one second, one slide? Yes. Or, sure, go ahead. Just to give a sort okay, of... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, sort of graphical picture. So uh, the hybrid systems is a language to describe a mixture of automata and physical systems. Mm -hmm. Um, but I see this framework very much as a concatenation of uh, the framework that describes physical systems through differential equations and the framework that describes automata to switching logics. And um, so, of course, in that sense, uh, spiking is, is an example, is, is a very special type of hybrid system. Um, but I see more spiking as at the intersection of automata and physical systems. So, to me, uh, an excitable neuron is both an automaton and a physical system okay and sometimes it behaves as an as an automata because you can count the spikes but it also behaves always behaves as a physical system so to me um spiking systems are a very narrow class of hybrid systems and and you want to exploit this uh, the, the special nature of of spiking to make it um hopefully to, to, to develop something more tractable because hybrid systems theory is a very general framework and, and um, it's also very hard to obtain concrete results um, in, 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 if, if your framework is too general. Mm -hmm. but, but could you see, let's say, I mean, I totally agree with that, right? So a hybrid system too broad. So what are, do you see, let's say, tractable hybrid models that could be used for describing these spiky control systems? And maybe uh, exploiting the special structure that you have in that model. Possibly, at, at least at the level of simulation, you know, uh, if you if you re if really insist on simulating a spiking systems through ODEs, you have a very stiff um, ODE, and it might be economical to replace the spikes by, um, you know, by switches. So I think that from a simulation viewpoint, I can see a clear benefit of using hybrid models of uh, spiking neurons. But for design and analysis, uh, in my experience, I, I haven't really um, found a, a way to exploit um, the framework of hybrid systems. Yeah. I have to react to that as well. You know, there's a big mix up between being spiking and being activity driven. You can either focus on the minutia, the biophysics, to understand how brains do it, or you can focus on the idea that activity is driving computation. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe you, the, uh, the layer of abstraction you should apply when you're trying to develop um, artificial control systems, right? It, the fundamental concept here is that activity is driving the computation. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I don't want people to get mixed up that every um, event-driven control system that's neuromorphic has to have spikes. Mm -hmm. It somehow has to entail the idea that the sample rate is varying with time according to the activity level. In fact, in some way, the event-driven computing or event-driven control is not really the right name. It's a better name is like activity-driven uh, control. It sort of was an unfortunate name because an event is less... Um, activity implies that something really happened. There was some activity. An event uh, is more vague for me. Anyway, but I, I I have it the other way around. To me, activity is very vague, but events uh, mean something very special. Um, and what is special about an event is that it's localized. So it's always very localized in time, localized in space, and you, you want to exploit this locality of of the signals. That's also true. So I take back what I said. <laughs> But I do, but I do think there is a big bias to be a little bit too slavish towards the idea that you should send binary events that don't have any payload in the neuromorphic community. Oh, definitely. No, yeah. the, the the event the event can have payload, a big payload. Absolutely. And by the way, one of the things that came up during the workshop also is that uh, 
an objection to this pure um, integrate and fire view of neurons as completely resetting state. They don't reset the state of the neuron. The neuron has tons and tons of state, you know, even when it, even when, after it sends an event. So that's the wrong way to look at it as well, if you want to consider at least the biology. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the very nature of event-based um, signals in, in, in brains, in, in nervous systems, is, is the diversity of events. It's not just a spike. So yeah. a burst is an example of, you know, a burst is not, is not just a train of spikes. It, it's another event. And, another and, type of event, yeah. It's a way to send a payload in some way. It's the only way the brain can do it, right? Not the way we have to build it. Okay, maybe we should go on. Uh, let me... Yeah, let's go ahead and move to the second question, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I'll read it quickly. So how are the well-established fields of event-triggered control, event-based control, related to the aims of neuromorphic or spiking control? Uh, and I put some leader questions in here. Could one be considered a subset of the other? And then what is the differences in their capabilities? Let's ask, let's go to Rodolf, the last one, and to start this time. Do you yeah. have any any okay. reaction to that? Or well, I I think that um the key, perhaps the key difference is not so much in the methodology, but in the questions, right? Um so um, and Maurice, so you should correct me if I'm mistaken, but but I may write that the main question that have been studied in even trigger control and even based control are stabilization question no uh, i mean stabilization is one uh let's say certain um operator type properties let's say in input output type properties but also consensus type properties right so as, as you see multi-agent systems so rendezvous cons so it's more general than that yeah uh, but in type type properties but i still feel that it's always a, a regulation question so to me, the the neuromorphic control is really a control theory out of equilibrium. It's very rhythmic in nature. It's very, you know, you control with rhythm, you control with um, patterns. You don't and control synchrony, with synchrony and coincidence. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. to me, that's the biggest challenge that that that. Uh, that neuromorphic control is facing is how to adapt control theory to um, out of equilibrium behaviors. Yeah, but, you know, but it has been used for synchronization purposes, for instance. Yeah. I think also Jorge, I mean, he, he wrote, uh, let's say, a sort of survey paper at some point on uh, event triggered kind of, of approaches to multi agent, right? And I think also synchronization was one of the topics there. Right. Yeah. Right, maybe Jorge, you can reflect on that. You had a paper with uh, your, yeah, your colleagues a few years can, back. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So I was trying to understand what Rodolfo was saying. Out of equilibrium, what what type of behaviors you have in mind? Is it like uh, you know? Yeah, that's right. Synchronization. Uh, no. The okay. The, the thresholds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, a behavior that has a threshold. A threshold is an is an input output property mm -hmm. for small inputs. You, you the, the the response is passive but for large inputs okay. the, 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 the the response is completely different I see I see I see so there is this heterogeneity I think this is this is something that this is a question that is essentially open in in control theory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to to deal with such properties what is what does it mean to regulate a threshold what does it mean to make a threshold robust? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All these questions that we talk, that we pose about equilibrium stability, mm -hmm. how do we generalize those questions to, mm -hmm. um, you know, thresholds and switches between different different discrete states and things like that? I see, I see. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, but maybe I, to ask uh, to clarify, so are let's say the thresholds and the switches to position them somewhere, is that the means or is that the objective? Well, um, for instance, uh, I very briefly uh, illustrated uh, how you could use a cellular control to control a network. So um, this is achieved not by controlling the connectivity of the network as it is done um, in classical network control. It is done by 
modulating the excitability of the nodes. So by making a node switching between, let's say, a spiking state and a bursting state, you completely change the network dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, there is a little bit of that in the topic of supervisory control or multi-rate control, but I think that it's it's something that it's quite a different paradigm than um, the paradigm of, the, of of control theory. Yeah. I would still say that the, the, the main task, the main performance criterion of any control task in control theory is equilibrium, is regulation. Even if it is to regulate you know, uh, an oscillation, it's still a regulation. If you want to make two oscillations the same, you want to reduce the difference between two oscillations. Mm -hmm. It is one aspect of control, but in neuromorphic control, you have the other aspect, which is to the orchestration of the of the of the system mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the system is also an automaton that switches between discrete states right 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 but, but, I, but, but I, what, what is the the because i'm still missing that so what is the eventual behavior that you want to generate right maybe, maybe by switching some of the neurons bringing them from a certain discrete a to a discrete b where they this let's say exhibit completely different behavior yeah but but you, you want to generate an overall desirable behavior. So what is the desirable behavior that you want to generate that is different from regulation and, or from synchronization? Okay, to me, to, understand. to me, the very central question is um, how you connect the uh, micro control to the macro control. Right. And so the simplest example would be that you have a network that is represented as a two-dimensional array. And now you control the cells and you want to control the cells in such a way that this leads to a pattern in the array. Okay, so you can define the macroscopic objective, let's say, which could be to regulate a, a certain spatial temporal pattern, a wave or a spatial wave or an oscillation. But your fundamental um, scale of control is at the cellular level. Right, right, right. So yeah, in so yeah, well, yeah, sorry. In synchronization, we make all the micro controllers the same mm -hmm. the, in, in the hope of making the macro scale, the macro, right. uh, the macro states the same as the micro states. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of very first level of micro macro control. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the, the, emerging, the emerging behavior. So Yorga, but that was also in your talk, I think, right? So at least in your first set of slides, where yes. we, you try to make, let's say, low-level decisions on, on, on how individual neurons behave and which state you bring them in a certain way. And yeah. then you want to maybe create at a macro level. Okay, no, that, that, that's a, indeed a typical, that are not the typical questions indeed addressed in, in, in control and certainly not in the event-triggered control field. So in control theory, synchronization, um, heterogeneity is always an enemy to synchronization. Right. I mean, so, so you always try to fight against heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we see in biology is that the heterogeneity of the population is key to the control of the population because it gives Absolutely. you a, it gives yeah. you an up to tune. So how do we reconcile those those that I think is really a, an, an interesting open question for control theory. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the brain has these diffuse neural systems like serotonergic and nor noradrenergic exactly. and so on that project in a very the, the, these neurons have vast fan out and they can affect huge populations of other neurons with these neuromodulators that affect, for example, yeah. their excitability state. Yeah, so it is um, it's definitely relevant. Jorge, did you have something to add to that? Uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought, actually. <laughs> 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 but yeah, at some point I wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I think I was understanding better what Rodolfo was trying to say. And uh, also his comments in the talk about the you know control being monolithic, <laughs> right? I, I think I understand what, what he meant by uh, that, right? I mean, we are kind of on the you know robust, uh, safe side, right? You want to guarantee no matter what, right? And so that's why, you know, you, you increase, increase uh, maybe the size of the disturbance and you still want the same sort of guarantee, right? That maybe grows. Uh, but what he's saying is that, um, yeah, this is not what you will observe here, right? There is the issue of the thresholds and then there is the issue of heterogeneity. Um, 
So yeah, I, I think, I mean, for what is worth in, in the problem that I was talking about, the goal-driven selective attention, we found um, that, uh, yeah, the, this diversity of interconnections and the diversity of the, you know, the layers, right? Uh, that helped, uh, and, and it was challenging, right? And, and daunting. And then I, I guess maybe I wanna echo that, uh, observation that uh, yeah we lack right now the tools for scalability right it, it, uh, I, I don't know that we can for instance interconnect hybrid systems no many 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 hybrid systems heterogeneous and know what what behavior will come out of it <laughs> well you know um uh, john doyle at caltech has now developed this sls framework for supposedly doing this i'm curious whether you think this is one possible way you they, know, they, system level synthesis. Right, system, system level. Synthesis. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, enough about it. Is, to yeah, the, the SLS goes very much along the lines of what uh, Rodolfo was saying. I mean, there is uh, all these, you know, SDPs, right? Uh, Semi-definite programs, no, uh, to to synthesize basically, right? So it it goes into the convex optimization monotone kind of you no know, uh, area. But I, I, I don't know it well enough to be able to, to see. Okay. Well, to, uh, one short answer to that is that the, the SLS framework is very much centered uh, around the concept of localization. So it exploits localization to make computation very sparse mm -hmm. and scalable. And I think that is very well aligned with the uh, questions of neuromorphic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also, yeah. Okay, um, I think we we're actually out of time, Levy. But shall we do one more or not? Um, yeah, if if the panelists are available for a few more minutes, I think we should do one more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, this is the third question, so it's kind of been in order here. Uh, the third question is: since the brain can be considered as a large network dynamical system, and neuromorphic engineering is typically inspired by bio-inspired or brain-like behavior. Uh, is there a strong connection between network control and neuromorphic control? Uh, and perhaps maybe Jorge can take this one first. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm sure there is. I, I, I fear that, you know, the problem here again is the is a scale. Uh, no? and, and even though in network control, we try to, you know, reason, it's not that we limit ourselves to, you know, low dimensional networks, at, at least in the type of results that we, you know, guarantees and everything, but um, yeah, I mean, th things get very complicated very quickly, you know, as soon as you move away from linear systems, <laughs> and, and when you are dealing with the brain, definitely you're going to move away from linear systems. Uh, when you start um, interconnecting these things and dealing with network of networks of networks of, uh, um, so so yes, is there a strict connection? Definitely. Uh, uh -huh. Is network control uh, ready enough? I don't think so. Uh, so maybe a follow up to that would be what was what is the largest network control problem that you've seen? That could be at least analogous in any way to what we do in normomorphic engineering. Distributed power systems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, power, power systems, systems are, are huge power. networks. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I, I would say power systems, but um, but you know, again, power systems. Yes, but but there is a lot of we we know pretty, I mean, reasonably well, right? What, what the physics is, right? And so then mm -hmm. we know, you know, we are gonna do, okay, swing equations. They are non-linear, but okay, you know, we, we you know, just science, right? And, and we know what, what, what type of dynamics we should be looking at. And then, you know, if we wanna go at varying degrees of resolution or fidelity, then you know, you know, what, what you are supposed to, what, what type of non-linear dynamics or terms you are supposed to add, right? We, we don't know that for the brain. I mean, we, we <laughs> and, and so this is one, yeah. What about, what about internet traffic control? There you don't know so well, right? Yeah, that's, that's model, a good point. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's At least you can point. measure there. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a good point. Yeah, 
that's a good point that this is like a created system right that doesn't have necessarily a physics but you know somehow we we design the rules right at least the local ones right like tcp ip and so we have a sense no that the, this is what the dynamics that is happening no at the level of dns servers and, and things like this uh, yeah i i yeah the, the, the scales in the brain are so different, right? When you go from the micro all the way to the macro, I think there was a question about that uh, earlier, right? That, that you know, do, should you go to the, all the way to the biophysical, no, neurobiological modeling of the behavior of the neuron? Or, you know, do you start aggregating? But aggregating can mean so many different things, right? There, there are so many levels uh, in, in, the, okay. in the levels of aggregation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that's very exciting. It's a very exciting challenge. And uh, I know of some success stories, but I don't know that we know, yeah, what the right, and maybe there are not a set of equations, but, you know, depending on the scale at what you're looking, there are different, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. Looking at. Yeah, thank you. I think all we're right. really all out of time. Yeah, we yeah, are really out of time. Let's thank our, our panelists once again, and especially uh, Maurice and Rodolph for staying up so late to do this. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, guys. This was really great. Thank and you. the whole audience should be aware that the um, this event is recorded and it will be made available later on. Yes. So we can look at it later. And um, please free... Uh, I would ask all the panelists to suggest one thing to help a neuromorphic engineer who doesn't know much about control to learn about the area of neural control. Like how can somebody outside, you know, who doesn't know much about control, get an entry into this field that's been worked on by control engineering for 50 years? It's really an imposing hill to climb for outsiders. Mm -hmm. How can they get into it? What sort of problems should they tackle? That'd be extremely useful, I think, the community. So I can start. Yeah. My advice is to study classical control. Predict classical control. To study classical control. Right. Uh, okay. Robert Snell. Know, know the background. How 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 to how to trade robustness and performance in a linear system? I think that's a very okay. important insight. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Maurice. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a bit tempted. That's a difficult so, question. I know. Learn the yeah, back, learn but, the but, learn the history, so I, right? I, I, I see where Rodolfo is coming from here. So I I I mean I mean that that's a very classical thing, and that's also I think what you want to generate. On the other, I mean, but, but maybe I'm now thinking too much from my own personal interest. So I I would like to understand so how hybrid systems models can be used and and capture some of this behavior. So. Maybe also people may, maybe try Rodolfo's approach certainly, but maybe if there's also a small community that tries to see how can we write down, let's say, neuromorphic control systems in appropriate mathematical models, and with that opening up to the field of control and actually create uh, some cross fertilization. I mean, I, I would be very happy with that. At least. So learn to write the neuromorphic stuff in the language of the control community. Right. right. Okay. Good. Cross the, bridge, yeah, to, to cross the 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 two uh, to, to bring the two fields together. I I I I second the the two things that Rodolfo Maurice had said. I, I mean the the yeah, just for my own benefit, yeah. The the what Maurice said would be fantastic. And actually, you know, the the success story of 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 the talk that I was giving today was because my student made that effort and so he 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 did the phd jointly in engineering and uh, cognitive neuroscience right so that okay. he was the translator for me right so so that that would be that that, that would be definitely valuable. Okay. and the suggestion right. in the chat is also a good a fantastic su su suggestion this uh, you know introductory control book feedback systems by mm. Aston and Murray. That, that would be a fantastic book yeah. yeah thank you everybody all right thank you very much yes Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. And good night bye and bye good bye. morning and everything to everybody <laughs> all over. Okay. All the best. Thanks, you.